Hey folks, this is Tyler coming at you from the coffee shop, which is right next door to our bookstore. Hey, if you want to get involved with church, this is a great place to start, and they could really use your help. That's right, Tyler, you good-looking devil. You know, we just can't clone the volunteers we already have, and so we need your help. Stop by after service and talk to Sherry, and she'll get you hooked up. While you're there, why don't you grab a caramel latte? It's on special this week for a buck and a half. Can't beat that. Way better than Starbucks. I like that guy. <laughs> If you're a parent of a high school or middle schooler, you're used to seeing this. Hey, coming up October 12th at 7 o'clock over in the high school building, we got an info meeting for all parents. And it's a great time where you're going to catch the heart and vision for what's happening here at the youth ministry here at Canyon U. Come check it out. Well, here I am in the bookstore. They got me working. Not a good move. But here we got a lot of great books on leadership. If you don't want to read a book, we got the Enrich Seminar coming up. How to Increase Your Leadership Muscle. You check that out. It's going to be October 5th at 7 o'clock. If you need more information, read in your bulletin or go to the group's desk. Oh, that's a good one. Good job, Tyler. Hey, that's about it for this week. Remember, you can track us down on Facebook, on Twitter, or go to our website, cannyviewchurch.com. You can also read through your bulletin. It has lots of great information on there. Or you can go out to the lobby and talk to some folks behind those desks. Have a great week. People are happy to get vegetables, and the workers, when they come to pick, they get first picks. They're the happiest. So we're needing pickers and distributors. We're ready to open phase two for next year, which is the rest of that field down on the other end. And the one thing that's stopping us is the harvest is plenty and the workers are few. But it's got a great reward, and, and there's lots of lots of vegetables to pick. It turned out much more larger than what we envisioned. That uh, that we would have this this much produce off of a little bitty place, but God showed us how to put it together, and, and uh, it's working. Boy, that's amazing, isn't it? The great thing about the, the garden is uh, it's been a great outreach to our neighbors, that uh, neighbors come by and they offer them vegetables, and we also uh, have given it to the poor and those in need. And so um, I think as we as a church of being the church to our community have found another way to express the compassion and love of Christ in a very tangible way. And so if you see uh, Rick Kanegi or Weldon Allen, a cu couple guys that really spearheaded this, would you, and, and also to Alan Ferris, would you give these guys a big hand of thank you for all of their work that they've done? Well, uh, we're continuing on in our our series in Acts, last week we took a little break from it as Carl Medeiros was here. And, and if you guys weren't here to hear Carl and his message, I really encourage you to either go to the website and, 
and download the, the message or get a CD because it was powerful of challenging us to be people of, uh, of faith in Christ without being religious and without being out there to convert people, but we're just loving people and leading them in the direction of them to be ex- able to explore Jesus themselves in a non-confrontive way. And so, uh, like I said, Carl's whole understanding of, of how to truly be a believer, a, a follower of Christ in the world in a way that is non-contentious has been life transforming to me. It really has. And it's been an awakening in my own life, in my spirit, of how to follow Jesus in the world. So I, I invite you guys, encourage you guys to pick that up. Now, as I move into the message today, the one thing that I see in the, in the message that we have today from the scriptures is what comes to my mind is in our society, in the U.S., in the West, there is this incredible pressure that is put on us from a very early age to perform. And so you remember growing up, for those of you that have grown up, and we have those kind of ambitions that are put on us. It, it starts at an early age of, of learning how to do your ABCs. And so you be able to spell an A and your parents go, that's great, Kirk, great job. We start playing sports. And so you have this, this ambition to excel in athletics. And if you do anything right on the playing field, everyone cheers for you. Then as you get up higher in school, there's the, uh, the pressure to do well in your ACTs and to get into college, to get a scholarship, to get a degree in something, or to get a career in something so that you can be successful and have a good career, right? Then we have this thing called marriage, and we want to be a good husband, we want to be a good wife, and, and we put these expectations and pressures on us. We want to be good parents. Remember, you got to be nice to your kids because someday they'll be taking care of you, right? So we want to be good parents. We want to have an honorable life that the kids look at us and say, you know, my parents are great parents. But the thing that always happens is, is where is the line that we cross where we say, I have accomplished what I should accomplish. When do we know we've done enough? And the problem is, is sometimes when we obtain our goals and we achieve where we want to achieve in life, then it becomes, now what? Irvin Berlin, he said, the toughest thing about being a success is that you've got to keep on being a success. It just never stops. The pressure never stops. There's that social strata in society that we can become confronted with and that, you know, that whole adage of uh, trying to keep up with the Joneses. When do we have enough? When can we show the world that we're successful? And when we're always comparing ourselves with these other people, Max Ehrman said, if you compare yourself with others, you may be bitter or vain, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Interesting saying, isn't it? As I look at this topic, the thought that came to my mind is a scene at the end of the epic movie Saving Private Ryan that came out in the 90s. And this scene just grabbed my heart. It was one of those scenes that when I saw that, I went, oh, gosh. That is so indicative of what's in my heart. And in this movie, if you haven't seen it, there's a small band of soldiers, U.S. soldiers, that are led by Captain Miller. And they're given the orders to go behind enemy lines and find Private Ryan. Because Private Ryan had three other brothers that have all been killed in the war. And so they were to go and find Private Ryan and save him so that the army could send at least one son home to his mother, his grieving mother. And 
In this battle scene towards the end of the movie, Captain Miller is, is critically wounded. And he grabs Private Ryan and he speaks into his ear and he says, James, his name was James Ryan, earn this. Earn this. And then we fast forward at the end of the movie where we have an aged James Ryan that goes to the graveyard in Europe and he goes to the, the grave site of Captain Miller and watch this scene of this poignant discussion with his wife. My family is with me today. They wanted to come with me. To be honest with you, I, I wasn't sure how I'd feel coming back here. Every day, I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I earned what all of you have done for me. James. Captain John H. Miller. Tell me I have led a good life. What? Tell me I'm a good man. You are. The point I'm trying to make with all of this is that for many of us, there's that gnawing question that just seems to continually loom there. Have I done enough? Have I earned it? Have I lived my life that someday people are going to respect me for what I've done? And some of you younger folks that are in this room right now, that there's that question of, of someday... What will people say about me in my life? Have I lived my life in a way that it actually left a mark of eternal significance in the life of another person? How will people speak about us or remember us when the Lord calls us home, whenever that is? I have a a dear friend that's fighting for her life right now. She's at Swedish Hospital in Denver. Last night, she had a stroke, and they flew her to Denver. And as I think about my friend Mary Lou, Mary Lou, for the last 20-something years, has been a foster parent in Fremont County, or in uh, Mesa County. And her and her husband, Jim, have literally poured their life out to literally hundreds of kids. These are troubled kids that have experienced incredible hardships and abandonment and uh, even disgrace in their life from the choices that they've made. And, and Jim and Mary Lou have continued to open up their homes to these kids and just expressed their love to them. And as I, as I was praying for Mary Lou all day today, she was continuing on my mind. I thought of the lives of so many kids that Mary Lou and Jim have touched. And, and as these kids have grown up, many of them continue to come back home to Jim and Mary Lou's to see them like 
I would go see my parents because Jim and Mary Lou have had that much of an impact on these kids' lives. And, and so I think about what I've learned from her is that Mary Lou has taught me how to love the unlovely. She has taught me how to accept those that have been rejected. She's taught me how to accept people into your homes that have been abandoned and discarded. And when I look at a life like that, it teaches me, it humbles me, and it asks me, it forces me to ask the question, what have I done to impact the life of another? I think as we would strip it down to the, the deepest core of our being, one question that all of us should be asking is, am I making the grade in God's eyes? And so, if we ask that question, if we would really take the time to honestly ask that question, if we could see God face to face right now, and we could ask him, God, did I earn it? Did I make the grade? What would the Lord say? Psalm 9.8 says, He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. And one of the things that we have to understand, and the scriptures speak of this, is that there will be a judgment of the believers and the non-believers. There will be a judgment of those who follow Christ as much as those who have rebelled against him and not accepted his atoning forgiveness. And we will be judged according to our works. Now, this doesn't mean that if we don't do the right works, that we will lose our salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. But I do believe that there is, for those that have faith in Christ and the work he did for us on the cross, we do face a judgment ourselves, a judgment of the saints. And so how do we know that we've cut the grade? What's the bottom line? And when we look at the text in Acts 24, and we look at the trial of Paul here, he makes a statement that we'll get to that I think summarizes and makes the point to help us to understand uh, where God draws that line. And now we are in Acts 24. And we remember that Paul was arrested and he's brought up to Caesarea and he's brought before this dude named Felix. Felix is a Roman, uh, an official who is judging uh, the people of the land. And so it says that uh, the priest, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Now, it's really interesting. When you look at what's happening here and you kind of understand the context of the culture here, Tertullus is actually a Roman uh, lawyer. And so there's a couple of things that show the hypocrisy in the religious guys here is, first and foremost, a Jew teaches that you don't associate with anyone that isn't a Jew. That if you go into any kind of business endeavor with a, a Gentile, you become defiled. So these guys overlook that as they hire Tertullus. And we see some other hypocrisy that goes on here. Now, Tertullus goes before Felix and he says, we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. They're trying to butter up Felix. You understand what's going on here? Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. The reality is, is the Jews hated the Romans being in their land. This was as far from the truth as we could ever see. He says, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. And now they give the charges against Paul. He says, we have found this man, Paul, to be a troublemaker. 
stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. When he speaks of the world, he's talking about the Roman Empire world. That's their world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him your, yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. And the Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. Now, these things that were brought before Paul were not true. They were twisting of the truth. And as they're making these accusations against Paul, this twisting of the truth is a means that people use to slander another person. Some of you in this room, I, I can only imagine, have had situations maybe at your work, maybe in a divorce settlement, that you were slandered by the other side. And Dr. Wade Silverman describes the impact that slander can have on a person. Those who are targets of slander are usually victims of convenience. They are chosen because they are unable or unwilling to defend themselves. The motive is usually anger born of frustration and our self-aggrandizement. The victim is in a relatively weaker position than the perpetrator. The latter attempts to raise his or her status through this process, and the perpetrator cements the process by proving through innuendo our false witness that the victim is guilty of some negative deeds. Now, when a person is slandered, our natural desire is to attack back, right? I mean, that, that's human nature. When it's the flight or flight kind of response that I think God's created us with, and so naturally when we are attacked, normally we want to find some way to attack back, to defend ourselves, to protect our honor, to protect our name. That would be only natural. But it's interesting, as we look at Paul, he takes a different tact. He doesn't attack his accusers. So in verse 10, when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. He just simply was walking through the temple area. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. Now, listen to this. In verse 14, he says, However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they called a sect. So basically Paul is saying, Hey, if I'm guilty of anything, here's what I'm guilty of. Try me for this if anything. He says, I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So Paul makes mention of that right there. Resurrection of the righteous and the wicked for the judgment. You see? He says right there. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, these two verses right here, I think, really nails it. And what I want to talk about is, is this is what I see, three elements of how we could live to have a guiltless life before God. And the first thing that I see here is what Paul, Paul said, is that I worship the God of the way. Paul is saying that our highest calling that we have in life is to worship God. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And what comes out of that is worship. And so when we look at being a worshiper of God, Jesus described what this worship is like as he was talking to a Samaritan woman in John 4, 23. He said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, 
the true worshipers, not the religious worshipers, but the true worshipers will worship the Father in what? Spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, John Wimber, who was the founder of the the Vineyard Movement, he spoke about worship, and he said that Jesus was saying, worship must be in keeping with God's nature, which is spirit, and it must be rooted in truth, which is found in Christ. And that Wimber is talking specifically of what Jesus said here in John 4.23. So, I think there's some misconceptions about worship. Many people think that worship is when you come to church and we sing a few songs to God, kind of get you primed for the message, get you in the mood, right? And then you hear the message, you sing another song, you go home and you say, I did my duty. I did my worship for the month. I went to church today. But the reality is, is worship is much deeper than that. Worship is meant to be Christ-centered. Worship is all about Jesus, and it's to Jesus. And so, if Jesus says the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God is in you, that means that worship comes through the ever-presence of Jesus Christ in our life. And so worship should flow through everything that we do during the day. If we would have this mindset that everything that I do, Lord, is in worship of you, it certainly changes what we do. It changes how we act. It changes how we respond to people that slander us. It changes everything because we know that what I'm doing right now is an act of worship to Jesus. Wimber also said that worship is not about personality, temperament, personal limitations, church background, or comfort. It is about God. We are called to do it for his benefit, not ours. Yet the irony is that we do indeed greatly benefit when we give ourselves to worshiping God. So I believe scripturally That worship is our highest calling as followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we put such a high value of worship in our church service. That's why we sing for a good half an hour at the beginning of the service. Almost half of our whole service is based on worship because he deserves it. Right? He, He is worthy of it. And so one of the things that we have to understand is when we worship God in singing form, it's a vertical thing. We are singing to God. We are singing to an audience of one. And it doesn't matter how well you sing. It doesn't matter how much you know the song, but it's something that flows out of the heart to him. It's like, God, I'm offering you my praise and my worship right now. And so sometimes the Lord may call you to raise your hands to him because it's an act of saying, God, you are worthy and I worship you. I don't care what everyone else thinks in this room right now because I'm only worshiping you. Now, it's, it's not a matter of personality. It's some people, they just freely do that. Other people, you may sit calmly and your hands may even be in your lap or in your pocket but you're focusing on God and you're worshiping him that's just as worthy because it's an act from your heart right some of you may feel like you want to get on your knees some of you may want to sit whatever God is speaking to your heart as a way that you are focused on him then that's what we prescribe here in our services We are facilitating us to corporately worship an awesome God. One thing that happens, some of you may have experienced this, that in the worship service, when we're singing to God, that something happens that you 
feel something 